Hello, and welcome to the 294th New Social Environment. I'm Alva Kajali, Special Projects Associate here at The Rail. And today I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming Kelly Baum and Randy Griffey, co-curators of the exhibit Alice Neal, Welcome First, currently on view at the Met. They'll be in conversation with Rail editor at large, Jason Rosenfeld. We're also so lucky to have the writer Devin Goldring here with us today, who will read uh, a few works to close today's program. Uh, so excited for you, Devin. Um, we've started all our events here with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on Lenapa Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Leland people of the Indian of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. If you'd like, uh, take a moment to share uh, the land you're tuning in from in the chat and some observations about what it's like around you. Uh, the second acknowledgement is that Black Lives Matter. In the, the Derek Chauvin murder trial and everything that has happened in the weeks since or, and over the past year, more generally, uh, it's devastating to grasp the violence and collective trauma of systemic racism in this country across not just individuals, but families, communities, and generations. Uh, please check out the chat for a living document of resources and actions as we do our part in the heavy lifting required to undo these legacies of injustice. Um, and now it's my honor to welcome our wonderful guests. Uh, Kelly Baum is the Cynthia Hazen Polsky and Leon Polsky Curator of Contemporary Art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She's been a curator for over 20 years uh, at many various and university art museums, including the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the Blend Museum of Art at the University of Texas at Austin, and the Princeton University Art Museum. She's published widely and organized uh, dozens of exhibitions. And to check out more of her curatorial work, check out the chat where I'll drop some shortly. She's joined by Randy Griffey, curator of modern and contemporary art, also at the Met, where he organized Reimagining Modernism in uh, 2015, which was a comprehensive reinterpretation of the museum's collections. Uh, together, they've curated Alice Neal, People Come First, which is the subject of our conversation, and Keeping Them in Questions, Israel Editor-at-Large, Jason Rosenfeld. Uh, he's a professor of art history at Marymount Manhattan College. He's the curator of John Everett Millay at T Tate Britain and the Van Gogh Museum of Pre-Raphaelites, Victorian Avant-Garde, also at Tate Britain and the National Gallery here in D.C., here in the U.S. in D.C., and River Crossings at uh, Olana State Historic Site and Cedar Grove, Hudson, and Catskill, New York. Uh, everyone welcome and Jason, take it away. Thank you so much, Malvika. It's great to be here and it's great to welcome Kelly and Randy to the fold. Uh, terrific to have you here. Thanks for making the time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. This was a high priority for us mm -hmm. when, when, the, when the invitation came, so. That, that's awesome because you two are two of the most busy people in New York at the moment. I think if we, we talk as we go about how many tours they have, they've been giving of this exhibit. Um, this is the, the, the bane, the duty, the pleasure of having a blockbuster exhibition. Um, so congratulations on that. We'll talk about it uh, a lot. I wanna thank, uh, at least initially, I wanna thank Malvika um, who's been my partner in crime here for numerous NSEs, I'm pleased to say, uh, Fong for leading us through everything and the rest of the great rail team who are supporting us. Great to have Devin here, um, who will be reading her poetry uh, later. And also I wanna give a shout out to the members, and this is a rarity for me as an undergraduate professor, the members of my Art 361 Curatorial Studies class, which is ongoing. We have two more sessions this term. Marielle, Kamaya, Kiva, Hannah, HG, uh, Ethan, Saul, Eva, Tara, Sheridan, and Avalon, who have been participating with me in a difficult time in doing curatorial studies. Um, and uh, we all went to see the show, those of us who are in New York. And then we Zoomed with uh, Randy last week. It was fantastic. And their discussions have been um, essential to me in my you know, thinking and, and considering Alice Neal and her work. And I say that from the position of an undergraduate professor because usually it's grad professors who are thanking their students in their seminars for helping them with doing their papers and you know, putting together projects and things. And it's not so common in undergrad, but I have terrific students at Marymount Manhattan College, home of the Griffins, and I just wanted to give them a shout out. So Alice Neal, let me start the uh, share screen and the presentation, which we have lovingly put together. 
I uh, hope everybody can see it. Yeah, visible, yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go, the, the four of us together. Um, and here is the opening to the exhibition at the Met. So blockbuster exhibitions in the time of COVID, uh, this is the one uh, so far. Um, I am very accustomed to lining up to see shows at the Met. Uh, the first one I can remember was King Tut. I think that was 1976, maybe the centennial year, 1976. And my parents got us tickets. And I remember lining up outside to get in and lining up inside um, Blockbuster show. And uh, you know, I was trying to search my memory of other shows that you'd ha I've had to line up for. I remember the last day of the Surah exhibition was packed and lines down the block. Um, the Magritte show had lines outside. Um, also, uh, of course, Alexander McQueen. Alexander McQueen was the most amazing, uh, not just because of the variety of people that came to see it and the fact that every single room was like the old sick train at rush hour um, packed, uh, but that there were queues that went through the entirety of the museum, it felt like. Uh, waiting, people waiting hours and hours. I was, never was more happy to have a Met ID than at that point. Um, but in COVID, it's quite remarkable um, that you're having people line up in this way and maybe speak to that a little bit. What has it been like curating this show in COVID and seeing it come to fruition and then experiencing this it in this you know very challenging moment? Mm -hmm. Kelly, do you want to kick that off? And well. Well, sure. I'll um, maybe I'll just say that that this project is part of what sustained Randy and I during the last two years. We it it came to fruition very quickly. Um, so we we had two years from beginning to end, basically, to organize the exhibition, write the book, uh, and we started we started composing our essays. Actually, the the same weekend the state shut down. So most of the book was was written during hard quarantine. Randy and I, I think we texted, called, zoomed almost every day, and um, it was it was our collaboration that was so um, important. Um, uh, to us, you know, um, to the exhibition, and um, and I think Neil herself. We took a lot of solace uh, from from her life and 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 her work, and um, you know, we we dove into it intellectually and and emotionally. It was really yeah. terrific experience, and I don't think either of us anticipated the response that it's received. I mean, I I think R Randy said the other day he was so funny. He said, "This is what it feels like to be a curator in the Costume Institute." <laughs> <laughs> right. So, and um, so, but I do have to say about the lines that might be a COVID regulation. We're trying to yeah. control the number of people that get into yeah. the gallery, but still, it's impressive. I get I get photographs from friends of the line snaking all the way down into ancient Near Eastern art. So I'm just I know glad the, it's new. The Cypriot, the Cypriot galleries yeah. have never been so full. Exactly. I know. The lines. It's true. <laughs> but you know, I mean, New Yorkers hate to line up. We hate to queue mm -hmm. for things. Forget it. That's why Resi and Open Table have been godsends. You know, we don't want to line up for stuff, but New Yorkers will line up for Alice Neal. I think that's yeah. that's part of it. COVID restrictions mm -hmm. notwithstanding. It's part of the flow of the experience, mm -hmm. I think. So you really started writing these essays a year and two months ago, mm -hmm. which is remarkable. And everyone should know that the wonderful catalog, which I'll hold up here, which is a handsomely produced book. And oftentimes people say that because they don't want to talk about what's inside of it. In this case, <laughs> it's really a beautiful book. It feels great. It's the perfect, it's portrait scale, which is ideal, right? And it has a nice feel. And the essay is are terrific. There's a, you know, there are a number of people who contributed to it, including my, my friend, uh, Susanna Temkin, who's at El Museo del Barrio, who's one of the curators of the terrific Triennale, which is on view now, which people should go see up, up near where Alice mm -hmm. used to live, right up there on, uh, in Spanish Harlem or uh, the upper, upper east side. Uh, and also essays by Meredith Brown and Julia Bryan, Wilson, terrific essay. So, you know, it's quite an accomplishment to put together a catalog like this in basically a year um, and have it be so, so, so thorough and nicely done. So uh, and kudos to you. And then I'm also wondering about, um, for those of you who haven't visited the exhibition yet, it's organized in rooms, which are thematic, not chronological. It's a little confusing, which is good 
at the at first Rob Store has a great essay about putting together exhibitions and it shouldn't be in immediately understandable he said you know you should come to it slowly um, but there's also a real openness um, every room is quite open to other rooms um, unlike the kind of old traditional way that a museum sort of leads you through a labyrinth uh, from room to room with one exit and I'm wondering if that part of that is because of COVID that the way you had to lay out the galleries just to provide more elbow room and ambulation? Um, I'll, well, first of all, Jason, I just wanna say what you, what the, your, your kind words are really, um, you know, we really appreciate them. And um, this was a labor of love. Um, it was also a labor of anxiety and mm -hmm. difficulty. And um, yeah, just to follow up what uh, Kelly said, you know, Neil really got me out of bed with a purpose. Um, every morning uh, for, for especially the last year and even longer than that. So, uh, so just thank you for your kind words. Um, the, uh, the sections are not byproducts or the, the floor plan is not so much a byproduct of COVID uh, about people because frankly, had we deferred to COVID restrictions or recommendations around traffic, we would have been very linear uh, and not allowed so much free flow as we as we do. So ah. the, the fairly open floor plan actually, you know, I don't want to make a big point of this, but it actually runs counter to uh, the way a lot of museums are now going about planning and installing shows where you have one way traffic, you exit out a different um, entryway, uh, your, your entries and exits are different, and then there's no backing up. Um, so you do, luckily you don't have any of that here. And as far as the sections go, I think, the, so the, the sections are roughly chronological within each section uh, with some give or take. Um, but I think one of the reasons the sections work here as well as they do is that they overlap conceptually so much. Mm -hmm. You know, home and New York are side by side because home, New York was home, you know, and, and home was New York. Uh, and then the counterculture section flows directly from the New York section and counterculture is full of New Yorkers, not exclusively New Yorkers, but by and large New Yorkers. Um, so I like that there's a great deal of conceptual overlap between the sections, which I think makes them feel a little more open um, and allows for connections that we wanted to make. Kel Kelly, do you wanna say something about that? No, no, I think, I think you're absolutely right. And it was amazing how, I don't think we made any changes to the floor plan after, um, I mean, the floor plan was, was finalized before COVID hit and we ah. did some measurements to make sure that there was enough room for people to move safely around corners and from gallery to gallery, but we were lucky. We didn't have to make major adjustments. Ah, that's that's mm -hmm. really interesting. And I think also it kind of plays to the idea which you're talking about of uh, sort of interpenetration of themes mm -hmm. because you get a lot of vistas. You know, usually yeah. in an exhibit, you get one vista out of a room and then you've got to think about what painting is going to be in the next room because that's what you're going to see going mm -hmm. forward. And this way you're seeing all different kinds of things sort of simultaneous. You can wander around and, and experiencing stuff, you know, in a kind of flow. So that makes a lot of sense. And in a way also, I think ethically, it kind of resonates with the theme of the show anyway. Um, and her approach to her subjects. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should talk about just the opening. Here's how you experience the show. Once you've queued for 50 minutes, you come in <laughs> and you go in and actually you have a lot of breathing room now. Mm -hmm. And you see this uh, painting in the middle uh, of the main wall, Margaret Evans, pregnant, 1978. Mm -hmm. So I know you've talked a little bit about this to other people, but not everyone has seen all the coverage like I have. So maybe talk a little bit about why you set on this painting to be the opening for the exhibit. Uh, well, on the topic of vistas we love, um, mm. this, this right out of the gate. Um, yeah, I mean, Kelly and I mm. fell in love with this painting. I think we, we loved it even before we saw it, but then after we mm. saw it in storage at ICA Boston, it just really knocked us back. Um, and it's, I mean, I'll, I'll just say, First of all, it's a fabulous painting, technically. Um, yeah. uh, it's just virtuosic. And it's one of the themes we really wanted to uh, assert in this show, which we feel like in certain ways, Neil's artistry has sometimes been occluded by 
overemphasis on the biographies of her sitters or her own autobiography. Um, so we really took opportunities to foreground her artistry uh, and how uh, facile, um, uh, facile mm -hmm. she was with a brush. Um, mm -hmm. Kelly, there's, there are lots of other reasons though, right? Oh, For yeah. Margaret Evans. <laughs> I know, yeah, this was, oh gosh, we just, um, we stared at this painting for an hour in storage in Boston. It's magnificent. So, you know, one of our goals in this exhibition is to recover Neil's reputation as a radical. And so, you know, for too long, she's been pigeonholed as a portrait painter who made images of quirky, irreverent art world celebrities and curators. And, 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 but too often people forget that, um, that she was pushing boundaries, even in her pictures of people. And of course she didn't like the word portrait or portraitist. She called her paintings, pictures of people. And again and again, she was um, breaking rules really from, you know, um, I mean, she broke a rule becoming an artist um, uh, as she did in the 30s and um, we find her painting people who, you know, she really wasn't supposed to paint, uh, painting pictures she wasn't expected to, to, to make. And this is true of her Pregnant Nudes, which is a series she launched in 1964. And Margaret Evans is the last and one of the best Pregnant Nudes from the series. There are very, very few precedents for this kind of work. And you won't even find very many mothers or, um, pregnant nudes for that matter in feminist visual discourse. And so Neil was painting against the grain of both Western art history and, and feminism when she made this very candid, you know, very honest depiction of a, of a pregnant woman. And she neither sentimentalizes nor romanticizes nor um, pathologizes pregnancy, which is, which is just what makes it so exceptional as a work of art. And as Randy said, it's, it's um, a stunning painting, just really, really well made. And happy belated Mother's Day. Yeah. Yes. To everybody. <laughs> oh, My yeah. mother's out there somewhere. Hello. Yeah. Happy belated Mother's Day to everyone. And motherhood is definitely a, a strong mm -hmm. theme. And mm -hmm. also the idea of, you know, showing her as a radical, um, yes. which is, is very strong and, and is very topical um, in this show and in this time. And I found it interesting that, you know, places have been reviewing this exhibit. Like I found one, uh, a review on Jacobin which is a, um, an Amer uh, you know, it's an online journal, which is uh, from, the, from the hard left, a socialist journal, mm -hmm. um, which is not the kind of place that would usually necessarily review an exhibit. I remember when I did, we did our show in, on the Pre-Raphaelites at Tate in 2012, and we had a whole section on uh, Christianity and labor. And so we got reviews from like the Christian mm -hmm. socialist journals, really interesting places because we're so used to the mainstream media which in the art world is even smaller in this country you know but mm -hmm. i mean i think when you take a position in an exhibit like this you might actually get a kind of broader audience mm -hmm. in a sense that you've done it with this show mm -hmm. so i think this in itself is a kind of radical gesture to start mm -hmm. with this uh, stark picture and we could talk at length about the gaze and about the use mm -hmm. of the mirror and about you know the sitter and the awkwardness etc and the you know the, the the beautiful treatment of the body but um let's leave it there and, and move on I'd just like to make the point that yeah, Jason, just piggybacking on Kelly's excellent point, is like radical in this sense has nothing to do with being conventionally or canonically avant-garde. Um, right. And mm -hmm. we're not making the case that Neil was avant-garde in a canonical sense of mm -hmm. 20th century painting, but she yeah. was still radical. And those, those two ideas are not mutually exclusive as mm -hmm. they've yeah. been made to be. Yeah. yeah, and also, yeah, I mean, you know, part of what made her so radical um, was her politics, and and I, it's interesting that Jacobin reviewed the show, but I'm not surprised. You know, she joined the Communist Party in '35, yeah. and you know, was was an advocate of social justice her entire life. So. Um, it's funny. Our, I don't think our communications office has sent along. No, that. they have not. I will, <laughs> I'm going to Google it. I'll send you the link. Mental, right? Yeah, please do. <laughs> Well, the thing I also find it interesting, having just been teaching Courbet 25 minutes ago, mm -hmm. is that, you know, the construction of the avant-garde and the idea of, you know, radical politics, but also radical gesture, style, et cetera, you know, it's not foregrounded in this show. It's not a deeply formalist exploration of her work until you get to the end, when it becomes quite mm -hmm. interesting with the abstraction room. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, of course, that's always how artists are couched at least or framed in terms of what they're doing on the surface with the brush, uh, with form, et cetera. And that, that is nicely evident in this exhibit 
but it is, I do think it's a challenge for viewers because you're confronted with the mature style, here it is, mm -hmm. right away. Um, and then you have to kind of work back because then you go into subsequent rooms and you see stuff like this. Mm -hmm. You're like, oh, okay. Because usually <laughs> we're so used to exhibit starting with the juvenilia, you know, the early work and then proceeding linearly. And here, I think there's a, a bit of a nice challenge for viewers to try to understand where she ends up um, with that. This is Ninth Avenue L from 1935. It's literally right over there from where I'm sitting right now. So this is Dos Caminos. Mexican restaurant here. <laughs> Meatpacking district pastis is right around here. Um, you should be having at, lunch there. Yeah, you should I know, be right now. Lunch. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you can now because they tore down the L. Um, but this was, of course, her neighborhood, right? Um, she lived on and worked on West 17th Street. Um, she always calls it Greenwich Village. Nobody would call it that now, right? Um, but it, that's kind of interesting because the Greenwich Village is sort of a larger frame. But she was living and working there in the 1930s and she's painting in the Depression these amazing, super spooky, um, Ensor-like uh, kinds of pictures of absolute alienation uh, in the city. And also, you know, something that's kind of very far from the typical WPA project, uh, the kinds of things like Rothko was painting of subways in the period have a very different feeling. So maybe just talk briefly about her early stuff, these kind of early works of the city. And then I'll show, I will show uh, Nazis murder Jews and talk about the way she uses the city as a staging for something very different. Um, do you want me to, Kelly, I can yeah, take, do you want to take, part and take, this, take the second part. Um, well, we, we often say that the, it's this moment, the WPA or a moment is the time where Neil was operating in closest proximity to uh, a larger movement, um, which is, you would say it's loosely social realism um, and we actually have this in the exhibition about Neil and art history with a WPA era work by Jacob Lawrence, which of course you don't necessarily think of Jacob Lawrence strictly as a social realist either, although mm -hmm. there is a dialogue there. Um, Neil's, but you, you're right, Jason, uh, that Neil's pictures of New York during the depression are even bleaker and then most of her male counterparts, I mean, I think of Reginald Marsh and others like that, where, you know, that they certainly didn't uh, flinch from the, the, the pain and devastation of the city, but they don't, re you know, somebody like Marsh doesn't reduce New Yorkers to skeletons and to skulls mm -hmm. like Neil does. Um, and mm -hmm. so there's a kind of surreal overlay in Neil's um, WPA era work, um, in some cases quite strange, uh, wonderfully strange in my opinion. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I don't know, you know, it's, it's just difficult too to know. Uh, I mean, she, she's in dialogue with the work of her contemporaries, of course, but you know, you, you, it's hard to know at this point what else she might be looking at and thinking about. Um, and it's maybe something we'll talk about as we move through slides is how to parse yeah. her sources which is really tricky business. And Kelly and I have some distinct mm -hmm. thoughts about that. <laughs> I'm but sure. Kelly, Kelly, you should pick up the second part. Well, yeah, about that. Well, I was going to say in relationship to her early, her early work, her early artistic communities. So WPA, Artists Union, Social Realism. What, what I found interesting is that she, when in, in a few early exhibitions in which Neil appeared. And so we have records of her showing paintings alongside male artists, most of whom, uh, um, most of whose names are not necessarily remembered today, artists who are exhibiting pictures of workers, um, mm -hmm. of strikers. And, and Neil made those sorts of pictures too, but what Neil would show were images of women and children and sometimes you know female forms of trauma and i thought that was very interesting in these lefty social realist circles in the 1930s neil is choosing to show quite different work work that yeah. is very unlike that of her male contemporaries and, and there's a there's a mother and child in this picture yeah mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. that's right yes exactly yeah yeah it's a, it's a interesting admixture of like what you know John Sloan was doing a few blocks away on Sixth Avenue and then Stuart Davis, but without the ebullience and color. And, you know, there's a, there's a graphic intensity here. I, I find these really compelling. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then she uh, combines these images of the city with, uh, with 
images of radical action, radical activity mm -hmm. with, um, with protests. So this uh, Nazis murder Jews, this is a, 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 this is a banner which should still be out there today. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Let's be clear about that. Um, it's declarative. And then with the communist flags, in the mm -hmm. background, you see that here. And here's a, a, a trolley. I guess there's a trolley mm -hmm. on the street, but mm -hmm. um, maybe talk a little bit about these kinds of images. She does numerous images of, of action, political mm -hmm. action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Neil, Neil painted leaders in the communist and civil rights movement. She painted um, the victims of capitalism, you know, unchecked capitalism. And then she also painted images of uh, anonymous activists. So this is a popular front demonstration from 1936, which we think that Neil herself attended, and she would have known the four figures in the foreground. Um, their names are lost today, but those are all artists who, mm -hmm. um, who she, um, artists who were part of her her larger community. And um, Brandy also pointed out uh, there are uh, police on mounted uh, or mounted police officers in the in the middle ground. And and you look at the date 1936, and this is really early for um, uh, for a group to to be calling out um, uh, genocide and, and anti semitism in in Germany. Um, yeah. And yeah, so Neil, you know, Neil was one year into the Communist Party um, when she landed in Greenwich Village or Greater Greenwich Village. That was the, the center of progressive politics in, in the city. And she wasn't far away from the headquarters of the Communist Party or the NAACP. And she just soaked all of this energy up. She was primed for it by a, a year spent in um, Cuba in the mid 20s. But she was, um, yeah, this, this reflects her political inclinations, her affiliations and her alliances. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, and, the, and the degree to which Neil is really um, consuming voraciously news coming out of the communist journals mm -hmm. that she began reading and subscribing to, and some of which are in the exhibition for the purpose of making clear Neil's uh, leftist communist affiliations and how they fueled her work. Mm -hmm. um, but what's interesting is a little later, Neil would disavow explicitly political art. Um, yeah. and, but, but we make the point that she remained a political artist even when she's not painting figures holding a placard that says something right. like this. Right. I think this is a very striking portrait um, mm -hmm. of Pat Whalen. Maybe talk a little bit about his background and the things I love about it are, you know, the, the clenched fists, mm -hmm. the sort of cloisonne style, which is a kind of toning down of what Gauguin had been doing in post-impressionism, heavy outline, mm -hmm. almost caricatural in a way. Mm -hmm. And yet then when it comes to the face, it's interesting, I'll show a picture of her painting later. You know, she, she always started out with outline but then that it, when the faces are resolved, much of that is subsumed in a way with, with glazing and layers. Sometimes you see the edge of a nose, which she, she obviously mm -hmm. liked the, the character, the, the cut of this nose. Um, but you know, otherwise the, the, the outlining sort of recedes when you get to the head. But here the mm -hmm. hands, I mean, I always talk about Rembrandt hands, faces, the vehicles for emotion and character. They're very powerful here mm -hmm. on the top of this uh, Daily Worker magazine from exactly Monday, June 16th, mm -hmm. uh, 1935. So uh, there's a whole series of images of these uh, politically committed figures in the um, second room, I guess, of the display of the exhibition, radical figures. Mm -hmm. And also too, this, an image like this makes so clear, I think the impetus for our subtitle, People Come First, mm -hmm. because- yeah. That's a quote from Neil, an excerpt from an uh, interview, which was really, she said, people come first to some extent as a critique of abstract expressionism in 1950s as dehumanizing, but she, she would change her tune at different points in time. But in this case, she's advocating for Waylon, a person, a man over the, um, the ship owners. And the, the, um, the, uh, it's, it's about a, a, a longshoreman strike for uh, wages and conditions uh, which dragged on. And so mm -hmm. People Come First is meant to say that Wayland should, should come before the, the ship industry which was exploiting labor of men of his class. Mm -hmm. uh, and he led a, a labor, a, a strike, uh, mm -hmm. which is being written up in the, the Daily Worker obviously, which is where Neil probably would have been reading about it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And she and also gives know, you an interesting, sorry, Kelly, interesting mm -hmm. perspective, right? Because mm -hmm. this will go away. This perspective will go away. Mm -hmm. From henceforth, it will be head on or yes. she's seated and painting. Mm -hmm. But this kind of, I mean, and you talk about the avant-garde, like Degas would use from above, looking mm -hmm. down as if she's on a stepladder, looking down mm -hmm. on him, which gives a different impetus to this picture. Mm -hmm. Well, Jason, actually, that's a great segue. I was, um, to my comment, I was going to say that we're not sure if she met Pat Whelan. We're not, we're not sure if this huh. was painted from life. And so there are a few pictures in the exhibition, one of which is um, Mother Bloor, the other is Che Guevara, which obviously was not painted from life or drawn from life, where, where we know Neil is painting her sitters based on drawings made after photographs from newspapers and magazines. And so mm -hmm. for the most part, Neil's sitters visited her home. Um, it was, you know, face to face, human yeah. to human encounter. But but the difference in perspective might be due to the fact that it was painted after a picture. So but we're not sure. I, I, I bet the chances are very good that this mm -hmm. is after a photograph of Pat yeah. Whelan yeah. and, and she, she's painting it and making it tr translating into a painting in tribute to him, mm -hmm. like, right. like she mm -hmm. did Mother Bloor. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. So let me do mm -hmm. a little art history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we were walking through this and, and I got the students like, what does this remind you of this extraordinary watercolor going back mm -hmm. a little bit? Um, 1927 bathing in a furnished room. Uh, this is part of a series of uh, unsparing images that Neil does. Um, the people at their ablutions or or after sex, we'll see in a second. Mm -hmm. But I saw this and like, wow, this looks like Die Brücke. Um, mm -hmm. German Expressionism, Pechstein, uh, Kirchner, these kinds of pictures, which they were making in Dresden in their studios with all their friends and um, collaborators and nude models, male and women, uh, this men and women, sorry. Um, you know, uh, it, it's extraordinary the, the, the coherence between these kinds of works and what she's doing. Mm -hmm. And on the left, this painting, this watercolor is not something that she continues with. It's something that she mm -hmm. eventually then sort of moves beyond, but um, it's a great choice of an object to have in the show. Yeah. Yeah, she, um, this, this period between 1927 and 1930 is really interesting. And you see in the section, Human Comedy, three works that are made between 1927 and 1930. And they demonstrate the vast range that Neil was capable of. And so one is very expressionistic. Um, that's Well Baby Clinic, um, expressionistic in the vein of bathing, but it takes it to a kind of Baroque emotional extreme. And then there's the very abstract, almost suprematist <laughs> painting called Futility of Effort. And then the yeah. meticulous photorealistic drawing based on her time in the psychiatric hospital. And they, they become a uh, she, but you can tell she was testing, experimenting. Oh, there's also the great nude, Ethel Ashton, which is very abstract. And besides demonstrating their range, I think they also are indicative of this moment of profound experimentation where, she, where she's you know, dipping into her toolbox and, and um, her art historical toolbox and, and seeing what, what feels right from a technical and artistic point of view. Yeah, and, and I should point out to follow on that, you know, she was, highly trained, academically trained, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, at yep. the Pennsylvania School, Philadelphia School of Design for Women. So mm -hmm. she knew her nuts and bolts, just like the artists in Dresden did. And this is a conscious decision to kind of work through different advanced styles in mm -hmm. art in, in order to find who you are as mm -hmm. an artist. And mm -hmm. what's amazing is it, it comes very quickly, it feels mm -hmm. like to me. So you go from something like this and then you have works like these, mm -hmm. which are mm -hmm. extraordinary. Um, the, the drawing on the left, untitled, this is her with her men, Alice Neal mm -hmm. and John Rothschild in the bathroom. Uh, a remarkable, candid image, um, somewhat uh, cartoonish mm -hmm. um, of them after they've had sex. She's on the toilet and he's <laughs> peeing in the sink. It's what you do in a cold water flat, I guess. <laughs> um, and then the one in the middle, Alice and Jose Santiago Negron, who was a musician um, and her, her, also her lover in this period. And then the painting of her uh, first kid, first mm -hmm. child who lived um, through adolescence and into adulthood, Isabetta. But, you know, here you see her just experimenting with, with different modes. And mm -hmm. I, don't, I wouldn't have looked at the work on the left in a vacuum and said that was Alice Neal. Mm -hmm. oh. 
No, I think they, no there way. are a few. I think there are a few moments maybe in the show to futility effort, especially. But yeah, yeah, yeah you wouldn't pick. Uh, I would not want the uh, image, especially or the one in the middle, for that matter, to show up on a, you know, art history ID exam, and no, you know, I, I would brutal. have like sixty seconds to identify <laughs> the artist. Yeah. Um, yeah, that yeah. that would be a nightmare. No, there's there's they're, they're remarkable, and mm -hmm. and I don't know, Kelly, you you speak so beautifully and deeply about this work um, and just how revolutionary it is on the topic mm -hmm. of politics that are not yeah. not explicit in the mm -hmm. or, tr or in a conventional political sense. Yeah, yeah, I was really, and I think Randy, this was um, sort of your approach as well, maybe a reflection of all of our <laughs> conversations during the spring, but, you know, we were aware of Neil's um, political affiliations. And so obviously it's, it's easy to track where her politics manifest in certain works. You know, sometimes she wears her politics on her sleeve, but Randy and I throughout the show wanted to identify the nooks and crannies, the corners where Neil's politics also inflect her art. And, and these uh, erotic, intimate, personal domestic pictures were not shown in the 30s 40s, 50s, and really they, they couldn't be shown until the 70s. They were celebrated by feminists. And it was Linda Nochlin who identified Neil as, as one of those pioneers uh, who, who reclaimed the genre of erotic art for herself. And what I like about the two on the left um, really is the way they parade Neil's sexual agency. And, um, yeah. you know, and it, they're, they're brilliant for that. Yeah. And I, I appreciate just also the the fact that she's making art about her unconventional mm -hmm. life choices as a woman yeah. uh, right. in the thirties. I mean, that she's devoting her art to these unconventional choices that she's made, um, mm -hmm. which are integral to her identity. Yeah. yeah. And they're things that she made, obviously not for distribution and not for sale mm -hmm. and not, mm -hmm. just works that she's making yeah. um, for herself. You know? mm -hmm. And, and it, it becomes a kind of catalog of different kinds of penises in her work as you go oh, through yeah. the show. <laughs> You know, yeah. how how ballsy for a woman to be doing that, right? It really is, yeah. Yeah. you know, and I think that's obviously why Linda was really interested in her mm -hmm. work. Um, Linda Knock, when we're talking about, we'll talk more about her later. Um, but the one detail I love about the one on the left is that he's wearing these little petite slippers. Yeah. You know? <laughs> no. he's, wearing, oh, no. he's wearing these little slippers to go to use the mm -hmm. bathroom. Well, um, also, it's just worth making the point because back when we were on Ninth Avenue L and the issue around what's the village and what we would call that meatpacking district, of course, now, yeah. but she was down in the village at 33 Cornelia Street until yep. December of 1935 when her lover at that mo moment, um, in a fit of jealous rage around this guy, around Rothschild, mm -hmm. destroyed a bunch of her work. And then yeah. uh, Rothschild helped to, her to secure a new apartment. A, a, a new apartment north. Uh, so, the, so in 1930, it's yeah, 1935. She has a new place that's clear near the Ninth Avenue L mm. scene that that we we looked at. Yeah, exactly. She moves around a little bit, um, and she suffers that early trauma mm -hmm. where she all her work is burned. Although mm -hmm. you know, it's such a Gosh, such yeah. a trope in the history of artists, right? The early work gets destroyed somehow. Sometimes it's the own art, the artists themselves mm -hmm. who do it. But here, this is a horrible thing for her. She's been amassing yeah. work. And I just want to point out that she lived only 10 houses down from where Taylor Swift would later live on Cornelia Street. <laughs> you can do with that what you would. <laughs> so, and but, also, too, I just made the point just to complicate things a little bit, too. But it occurs to me that these um, erotic watercolors where she's she is showing herself with lovers, she yeah. usually is in the background. She is yeah. behind. Mm -hmm. I think she's almost in the selection we have. Isn't she, Kelly, always behind? Her male companion. Well, there's the one. Or side by side in bed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Side by side in bed. Mm -hmm. side you know, side it's side. like it's like Kirchner's self-portrait with a model, with where where he's in that great bathrobe, mm -hmm. that great like chevron bathrobe, mm -hmm. holding the red paintbrush, and the models behind him. You know, but here she's inverting the whole thing. It's just not mm -hmm. not expected, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not erotic, the painting on the right, but yeah. it is explicit in mm -hmm. the same way. And I think explicitness is something about her work. You know, there's mm -hmm. that later portrait of the man who you describe him as a uh, as uh, man spreading in that one image. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she doesn't shy away from the frontal nudity, mm -hmm. even in a portrait of her daughter Isabetta. 
And it made me think about, you know, the tradition mm -hmm. of this kind of representation in art. Of course, yeah. Degas did not paint explicit images of these young ballerinas, mm -hmm. but there is a kind of fierceness in the little 14 year old dancer, mm -hmm. which besides her lower class physiognomy in Degas' work were, was one thing that the critics really were put off by, that mm -hmm. idea of a directness in Degas' representation. Um, and then of course, you know, it's an easy comparison, but it's a vivid one. Mm -hmm. Sally Mann's representations of her young daughters and family mm -hmm. in 1980s, late 1980s. This one on the left is probably the terrible picture. Mm -hmm. And Neil got in, uh, you know, in a lot of hot water for the painting on the right, not just at the time, although it wasn't really seen and the first version was destroyed, mm -hmm. um, but also even in the documentary that her grandson did in 2007, Alice Neil, there's still tension around this painting yes. mm -hmm. on the right. So maybe speak to that a little bit because it's such a stark, assertive image. Mm -hmm. Randy, do you want me to start or do you want to? Yeah, I mean, this is, there's there's a lot to wrap your head around here. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I, I need a minute to get my <laughs> gather my thoughts for Jason, if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. well, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll so I'll start um, by saying that this is the second version of Isabetta. So yeah. Kenneth Doolittle destroyed the first, Neil repainted it, and she would revisit the image late in life. And I actually wonder if there are other versions, maybe other drawings. Mm. The, the painting of Isabetta became a, a, almost a kind of talisman, like a, like a surrogate for, for Neil. So Isabetta was, was taken. Now, I, I don't want to reduce the painting to the biography, although the, but the biography is important. Matt, and, I'm yeah. trying not to a little bit, you know. I know. Yeah. So, well, so, so Isabetta was um, taken from Neil by her husband um, when she was young, raised in Cuba, and she returned for a few summers to visit with her mother, after which they became estranged for the rest of their life. And and there is, you know, I, I think one of the reasons why Neil chose to revisit the painting is because she had lost the girl inside of it. <laughs> um, and but as far as its explicitness, you know, this is um, a scene of of extraordinary intimacy. You know, this is this is a, a view that. It, this this view of, of of the young girl's daughter is one afforded to mothers. You know, it's a it's an encounter. Um, it really documents a kind of encounter between child and mother in in the space of the home, and that intimacy is not one that we're used to seeing exposed to view either in photographs or paintings. And so, yeah. um, it's it's the fact that it was commemorated by by Neil and made public that is so shocking. But Isabetta herself is. Defi you know, defiant and, and proud. And uh, Hilton Olsen, his recent review of the show described this as a picture of a girl who's daring her mother to love her. And, um, you know, there, there is a lot of tension in this, in this image. The pose is one that Neil would return to in, in depicting her, her granddaughters. But we, you know, we want this to be a hard picture. We don't want to, um, you know, it raises issues around autonomy, exposure, um, you know, exploitation. And, and so it needs to be grappled with. I think, honestly, needs to be grappled with. Randy, what would you Well, add? yeah, I mean, just on the topic of what you said earlier about Neil painting subjects that she shouldn't have been mm -hmm. painting mm -hmm. uh, and she, going places that most artists wouldn't be brave enough to go. I mean, this is, mm -hmm. helps to make that case as well. It's also maybe worth noting um, that we have Isabetta here in the home section and not in the mm -hmm. nude section, yeah. mm -hmm. which we could have done. Yeah. Um, and we did discuss it, uh, but mm -hmm. we made, I think the right choice in the end to, um, uh, I mean, if I say domesticate Isabetta, that, that maybe sounds like we're trying to avoid certain issues, but this is a domestic picture and it's about mm -hmm domestic nudity um, as a fact of life, mm -hmm. especially for children. Although, I mean, in yeah. this case, she's a little bit, she's not, you know, a, a naked toddler rolling around, obviously, but, um, but yeah. Um, it's and it's, it's next to Sorry. a picture of her son as well in the section on, on home, although he's clothed. But. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And it's interesting, you know, I could, from the perspective of myself as a parent, you want to commemorate your children through photos of your children and photos that that get them mm -hmm. as a person and and you know them better than anyone right mm -hmm. um and if, but of course portrait is a collaboration you know between mm -hmm. that mindset of the maker and the person herself so 
you know, there's something extraordinary about mm-hmm. the way that this collaboration uh, worked itself out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I think and, I, and, I, and I think it's interesting also the way that the, the way that their relationship has been discussed in the show and in your catalog is very different from the way that it is presented in that documentary, because in the documentary, they make it sound as if she gave her up. She, you know, mm-hmm. she left her there in Cuba yeah. and deserted her and went off to pursue her career in New York. But in recent literature, it is quite clear that this was not, you know, her choice, that she was separated from her child. Well, I think it's a case where both things can be true. Uh, I think mm-hmm. that, yeah. you know, I think it, it, it unfolded over many, many years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And at yeah. a certain point, I think Neil made the decision not to cultivate that right. relationship any longer, but right. it ha- mm-hmm. happened over many years. Yeah. yeah. So here's a photo on the left of her. I think you can correct me if I'm wrong. I tried to get this right. Um, in her house in uh, Spanish Harlem, 21 mm-hmm. East 108th Street, around the corner from El Museo del Barrio Museum of the City of New York, now up there on, and um, uh, surround, wonderful picture, because she's mm-hmm. surrounded by her, the products, mm-hmm. what she's been making in this vicinity. And uh, uh, the one on the right, um, TB Harlem from 1940, you see here in the photo on the top left. And this is a really striking mm-hmm. uh, image um, in the show. And it's representative of uh, the kind of, almost voraciousness of her eye when mm-hmm. she moved up there and the way that she was soaking in the culture, which mm-hmm. Susanna writes about in the catalog. Yeah. Um, and so maybe talk a little bit about uh, what happened when she moved uptown. Well, her life changed dramatically mm-hmm. in so many ways. Um, she and Jose move up in 1938. Uh, Neil is pregnant with what would be her their first son. Uh, uh, eventually known by Richard um, and by the name Richard and um, and then their relationship would end and they so she they in, uh, originally moved to 107th they break up and then she moves one block t- to a new place in 108th um, yeah in this photograph we we also we reproduce it in a section in the, the section opener on home actually yeah. um, because it highlights the fact that she was living and working, living with and working on her art at home in the same space where other aspects of her life were ongoing, including child rearing by, by herself at a certain point. Um, you know, it's staged in a certain way. Um, you know, she's obviously aware that we're looking at her. The photographer uh, is actually, would be the um, husband of her second um, son, Hartley. Um, so, I don't know, she moves away from the village. Um, I think, you know, that for that reason, combined with the fact that she has greater um, responsibilities as a, as a mother um, mm-hmm. and, you know, her uh, life becomes a bit more domesticated perhaps than it was in the village. And, you know, she, so she, it's a period of gr- great obscurity. Um, and it's mm-hmm. one that of course Hilton Alls through an amazing game-changing light on about three years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, In that exhibit, in the exhibit. Yeah, Yeah. Uptown. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kelly, you wanna add to that? Yeah, I was was going to say, um, you know, Randy and I keep learning uh, about Neil the more time we spend in the exhibition. And I I wonder if, you know, it seems to me that it's really um, not until, I mean, you'd have to count, you'd have to look at every single picture made by Neil and start to count and put them in columns. But it seems to me that she really begins her series, you know, pictures of people when she moves to Spanish Harlem. I mean, you know, there are fewer single and double portraits, we would call them, after she moves to Spanish Harlem than there were before. Um, Maybe fewer group scenes, fewer street scenes, but she really begins to hone her approach to painting people as individuals when she moves to Spanish Harlem. And, um, and, you know, the, the, she continues to paint activists, leaders of the communist and you know, yeah. communist movement, Puerto Rican liberation movement, but she really starts to focus on neighbors, family members, residents of the of the area. And so, you know, more and more, I think that 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 peer, that move was absolutely pivotal in the in in her future career. It really put yeah. her in touch with um, people on the streets as her primary subject. 
Yeah, yeah and I she mean, and she sorry. she uh, and um, hand in glove is that she abandons any kind of kind of social realist mm -hmm. style right. that yeah. we uh, right. would associate with the WPA. Yeah, and and she talks about art as a search for freedom. She's mentioned that mm -hmm. in one of her interviews. But I think her itinerantness or, or her her move, the way that she moves around, is also kind of search for freedom. You know, find a new mm -hmm. place, restart, reset. Mm -hmm. it, you know, not necessarily about her personal situation, but, you know, just put myself in new environs and see what mm -hmm. happens. And the product or, or works like this. I mean, we spent a lot of time in front of this with my class, the Spanish mm -hmm. family. I thought it was inordinately compelling, mm -hmm. um, the faces. And, you know, there's a sense of pathos and respect mm -hmm. in this picture. And I just throw up an Abbott Henderson Thayer because I love Thayer. Mm -hmm. um, this, and he's undervalued on every level. Um, at, but Virgin and Throne yeah. from 1891, not because he's, she's looking at Thayer, but just this idea of family, of connections mm -hmm. and, and groupings, which date back to the Renaissance and then was kind of rethought in the Gilded Age. And it has that mm -hmm. kind of four square quality. Um, and also the variety of people in this picture on the left, there's such a sense of empathy and also mm -hmm. close looking in this picture. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I love the fact that you pulled out Thayer here. In 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 our show, of course, we we pulled out kind of Cassatt as a even a much more obvious um, foil, I guess, for Neil. So I love yeah. Thayer as a bit of a foil here. Um, I think for me, this highlights the the degree to which Neil was very aware that she was painting people who had not been painted really um, in this the tradition tradition of Western painting. Um, so not that she was referencing Thayer, you know, or thinking as in opposition to Thayer or what his work represented, but she, but it rep, but it would represent a kind of tradition that she knew she was working against. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more so than Cassatt, who's okay, not that's not the that's not the uh, academy, right? Mm -hmm. Thayer is, uh, I would say extreme beautiful example of what academic painting where where it is mm -hmm. in that period you know and um and the picture on the left is just such a remarkable observational mm -hmm. kind of painting and then what's amazing also is at the exact same time she mm -hmm. paints something like this i was mm -hmm. in philadelphia uh, yesterday i went to see the senga nengudi show mm -hmm. which everyone oh. on the planet should go see oh, I'm dying philadelphia see museum of art it's up through july and um, this amazing little painting, which is based on uh, a memory, she said, mm -hmm. not an actual person, woman in pink velvet hat, but it screams Roz Chast for <laughs> the 1940s, <laughs> you know, but that's an uptown sensibility, maybe New York uptown sensibility. But, you know, it, it's amazing that it, here she can sort of go between the two. And I think mm -hmm. maybe this is kind of what you're talking about, Kelly, that transition from group images, mm -hmm. social realism into the more, I don't wanna say poster-like, but I think that's an aesthetic that people understand right now, mm -hmm. looking at portraiture right now, but that kind of very direct, coloristic, broad planes mm -hmm. kind of imagery, which you see here on the right, yeah. this amazing little painting. Mm -hmm. They have the same nose though, it's interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, Berenson, Berenson, said, Berenson said, you can always tell an artist through the noses, the nostrils mm -hmm. and the ears, that's connoisseurship. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, I, just here. also the, the image on the right, and thanks for throwing this into the mix. It's nice, you know, to throw images that aren't in the show into the mm -hmm. mix with works in the show that we feel like we've become so uh, well acquainted with. But there is part of me that I'll just say, you know, and this, it's a, like, it's not meant to be as a critique, but I think Neil also was so aware of not being, resisting the tradition of being a dainty lady painter yeah. And she sometimes overcompensates for whatever kind of, you, Kelly, do you understand what I mean? Yeah, yeah, you know, I that, totally, yeah. Um, you know, that because she, she does make kind of, I, I don't remember if they're um, uh, diminishing, but, you know, remarks about, you know, um, you know w women of her generation, if they were allowed to train as artists, were trained as mm -hmm. decorative painters, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. dainty decorative painters. And she was so opposed to that mm -hmm. for herself there are instances, and I would say that maybe the work on the right is one of where she's sort of overcompensating mm -hmm. for not wanting to be dainty and everything that that stood for. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah, true. One more work from Harlem and then we'll move to the West mm -hmm. Side. Mm -hmm. And this one also I love it. She just captures the character 
of these kids. And I wanted to celebrate this a little bit, Dominican boys on 108th Street, 1955, because I heard on NPR this week that Dominican Americans are now the number, the, the biggest ethnic group um, in New York City, 730,000. They have passed the Puerto Rican mm -hmm. population. Mm -hmm. um, they need a parade now down mm -hmm. fifth. Um, but you know, this image of this uh, assertive personality, mm -hmm. uh, the cuffed jeans, I love that. That's your, that's ideal dark jeans, right? Mm -hmm. And these jackets, it's just terrific. I, she thrived in this neighborhood mm -hmm. and then she moves across the park, right? Mm -hmm. She moves to um, th uh, th th 300 West 107th street. And here's a much later photograph of her um, from 1979, but maybe talk a little bit about that move, moving on up to the Upper West Side, but it basically, in, interestingly, laterally, right across the island from 107th, 108th, across to the West Side to 107th. Yeah, that that was um, what well, you know. The stories, it, the 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 reason for the move depends on on which text you read. But according right. to the to the family, she was. Um, um, offered a larger apartment for the same price across the across the park, and so sometimes you hear that she was pushed out by moving by by higher rents or desire to renovate the um, the apartment. But I think the the real reason is in between, you know, all of those um, yeah. explanations. But anyway, so yeah, she moves right across the street. She's sort of in the it's the upper upper west side, so it's um, you know it was still and is still a very diverse. Um, um, diverse community. Um, but, you know, this move coincides with, and this occurred in 1962, coincides with enormous shifts in her life and practice and critical acclaim. And so she, you know, she decides in the early 1960s that, um, that she is going to, her, her legacy becomes important to her. And I think she realizes that the, the communist luminaries with whom she'd been hanging out um, with to date were not going to be the ones that helped her secure her legacy um, for all time. And so she really begins to network within the um, mainstream art world. She meets Robert Smithson in 1962. She'd paint Warhol in 1970. So she begins to dip her toe um, after you know decades of um, of kind of self-imposed exile and, and neglect, she begins to dip her toe into the, um, the mainstream art community. Um, she has more room, bigger windows, the paintings, um, more, more, more room, more windows, the paintings get bigger, the palette shifts. Um, and um, yeah, and so you see all of these changes in um, uh, who she knew and where she was living play out in the canvases themselves. And then by 1970, she hits her stride. Um, um, also, there, there's the, that's the, uh, on the far right is what the, is the bench or the, the seat that Margaret Evans is sitting on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, down here, the, this is the apartment more recently from this documentary, which I'll, mm -hmm. I'll recommend to everybody. You got to drop, drop down $4.99 to rent it, but it's worth it. Um, online streaming services, and you see her Hartley Neal at the apartment, which is still mm -hmm. in the family, still they in the still family, rented. and, yep. and mm -hmm. still rented and preserved mm -hmm. as is. And it's extraordinary to watch that and see the furniture where all these people mm -hmm. were posed on. And mm -hmm. she would uh, she would set up her easel right in this room, yep. just, just paint away. You can, you can see how much light she had now. I mean, yeah. how much yeah. space and how much this light. This is north, I, mean, I think. It really changes. This is north, that, maybe? That would be north. Yeah. yeah. So she, she also painted, corner. she loved this view. And so she painted several pictures mm. just by, you know, looking looking at her yeah. window, peering across yeah. the street. Mm, self so here's an amazing self-portrait of mm. her where you get a sense of her. Now, someone's asking, when did she begin using this blue outline, which I, which I associate with Clozonism, but is her, yeah. really her own? Well, Randy, I, you know, the, the outline, the contour line begins in the thirties, but I, you know, I'm not sure when it becomes blue. Is it sometimes blue? 70s? It's a bit blue. It's dark blue around Isabetta. Um, oh, okay. So yeah. And, and it, the, the blue line, not always is contour. Sometimes it's the mm -hmm. blue line of pattern, yeah. Yeah. like in the little work of Christopher Lazare, um, mm -hmm. which is early thirties. Um, she gravitates to that blue line and, and it, it does become a signature motif, but absolutely absolute or exact origin point is, is unclear to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And here's, I took a couple of details and you get a mm -hmm. sense of the surface, which is just 
fascinating. And, mm -hmm. you know, in the close up, there's a little bit of impasto going mm -hmm. on here. Not a lot, otherwise quite smooth. You can yeah. see the weave of the canvas. Mm -hmm. She liked this sort of just white primed canvas. Mm -hmm. You see that there and, and uh, you know, very, uh, very visible brushworks. Yeah. And she always has in her left hand, this little raggy. Mm -hmm. um, and you see her painting, films of her painting. She always have, of course, this is not her left hand, right? Because she's left-handed. So the portrait that you're seeing here, the self-portrait is looking in the mirror and it's flipping her. So it mm -hmm. looks as if right. she's right-handed, yeah, but in fact, yeah. like Leonardo, she's left-handed. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that here in this uh, great mm -hmm. clip from a film um, that her son made of uh, Virginia or Ginny, his mm -hmm. wife in blue shirt, skirt, sorry, 1969 and, and, uh, and uh, Neil painting her. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I find, amazing about the way that she works is the straight up canvas. She doesn't use a mall shtick, meaning something mm -hmm. to rest her arm mm -hmm. on so she doesn't blur the surface. Yeah. She uses long brushes at a distance. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of those images of Matisse late in life where he was using mm -hmm. these long sticks to make lines. And it allows her not only distance from the canvas and to be able to see the subject, and you see Ginny in the background here posing, mm -hmm. um, not too painfully, uh, but it allows her to paint it from a distance. And also it ensures an unsteady line, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think is, is part of the MO, is part of the mm -hmm. procedure. I encourage people to go online and find this wordless clip, soundless clip of her painting this portrait. I think she's especially using those long brushes when she's making those contours, which was part mm. of her regular practice. And yeah. then she could go back in with with smaller brushes yeah. or for to do impasto. eyes and stuff. Yeah, I mean, but yeah, mm -hmm. that's a, such a great technical mm -hmm. point, Jason. Mm -hmm. But I think she did have a range of lengths of brush brushes. Yeah. Um, but but the, the but the contours uh, are require this long brush. Mm -hmm. Yeah, amazing. And then talking more about artistic influences, the second I saw mm -hmm. Marxist girl mm -hmm. Irene Peslikis on mm -hmm. the left, I thought immediately of this painting. And mm. uh, I was trained partly by Robert Rosenblum, the great uh, art historian, um, who was the master of the closely related school of art history and had the greatest eye of anyone I ever met in terms of saying, ah, this reminds me of this. And he was always correct. And then he always was able to um, couch it in a way that it made sense, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's never just it's never just an idle reference, right? There's always something to it. Um, but you know, Neil, whether she knew this Matisse or not, which lives in Copenhagen and is one of my favorites since I saw it at the MoMA show ages ago. Um, you know, it is the exact same pose as a canonical pose. Uh, and yet it made me think about the idea that her, not portraits, right? Pictures of people mm -hmm. are people in an unsparing way, in a very direct way, trying to get both resemblance and personality, but also whether they're nude or not, they're nude, they're naked in a way. Mm -hmm. And I really think of that, you know, when you yeah. talk about Jacques-Louis David and neoclassical painting in France in 1780s, every single one of his paintings started with nudes, life-size nude figures or whatever, and then he would add the clothes. And mm -hmm. she didn't work that way, but she did, she did in her mm -hmm. head, right? So I, you look at Marxist girl here on the left and you look at the Matisse, it's the same conception, right? Mm -hmm. The body is the body, the naked revealed person mm -hmm. is there. And then she just, you know, put some clothes on it, although she's fantastic at painting clothes. But the Matisse connection, I think, is strong in a mm -hmm. lot of her work. There's no Picasso. She's not interested in Picasso, um, Cubist space. Mm -hmm. um, she's interested in, in line and mm -hmm. contour. And color. Um, and color, I, I, yeah. yeah. And also just add too is I, I think, you know, in many ways, she's, she treats the body matter of factly like a still life, like, yeah. like the anatomy is a, like anatomy is a fruit. Uh, yeah. that might be on a table. You know, there's, there's that level of a kind of clinical, mm -hmm. old school, still life painting back in, you know, back in your classroom effect that she never loses. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is mm -hmm. Randy's most mm -hmm. favorite room, I, I know. Um, <laughs> this amazing room of, well, of these, uh, f these, these it, It's like it's such my a striking painting. installation. Yeah. And your favorite painting. Yeah. My so favorite painting. I'm just I, showing I, it. There, there are other rooms I like as much, but. Yeah. I'm just showing an installation shot on the left where you see some of the her uh, published work, poems and interviews, which I thought were really fascinating photographs. And then on the walls, you have uh, these figures. So there's 
Jackie Curtis and Rita Red. Um, and then I'll also show an image of um, another image in a second of uh, Jeffrey Hendricks and, and Brian. So maybe talk a little bit about the importance of this room to the exhibition in terms of her radical activity as an artist. Well, you know, by this point, Neil is gaining um, quite more renown than she had a bit of celebrity. Um, you could almost say going mainstream, but she never really fully does. I mean, what I'm always struck by as I enter into this room is Neil's idea that she was capturing a zeitgeist um, as she worked. Um, and that I think is the great effect of gathering so many of her works together, which you normally experience only um, one by one, is the aggregate effect of zeitgeist. I feel like I'm in the 70s when I am in this room. Um, and, you know, Jackie and Rita here are, um, I always, Kelly's heard me say this a thousand times now, but it's a minor crime that this picture ever left New York. Um, you know, good on the Cleveland Art Museum for having it, but it, it should really be at the Met. <laughs> but it's not, not everything, not everything can be at the Met or, or no. Met, unfortunately, but, um, but yeah, I, I know, Kelly, and I know we're running long on time, so we want to be mindful of Q&A and, and time for Q&A, so. Well, there's this painting, and then there's this one, which you've mm -hmm. been using as the poster um, outside and the banner outside the museum. Jeffrey Hendricks and uh, Brian, um, this image of, you know, people living the life that they're entitled to live, mm -hmm. essentially. And I think yeah. she's so respectful of that, but mm -hmm. she's also not above having some fun, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the still life, um, the open shirt, so terrific. The cigarette that should be there that isn't mm -hmm. there. Um, I, I see that really clearly in the arm around the back, you know, yeah. um, it's, a, it's a beautiful painting. Yeah, we're very, we're very happy to have it as a signature image for the show for a whole range of reasons. It's mm -hmm. a dynamite painting to begin with. It signals her inclusive spirit. Um, the exhibition, though, does highlight her limits uh, around um, various groups of people, including gay people and especially gay women, yeah. um, because she had limits like we all do, um, mm -hmm. despite the, the kind of popular myth of Neil as endlessly empathetic. Um, also, on a more pragmatic level, they crop really well. Um, the Met, the Met has like five very rigid lockups for design. Yeah. Like the the banner has to do this, the stanchion sign has to do this, the web has yeah. to do this, and Jeff and Brian are wonderfully cooperative mm -hmm. um, for cropping in perpetuity. Yeah. That's really funny. Well, and Randy didn't mention it, but his entire essay for the catalog and, and all of his research yeah. is really focused on Neil's um, LGBTQ sitters, yeah. which which he traces from the right from the twenties all the way up until the the nineteen seventies, and and so he he parsed her relationship to her queer subjects and yeah. when they appear, how they appear, and um, you know it's a super. Right. This, I mean, in this instance, they were a couple. Um, she yeah. showed, she painted a, a other queer men, gay men, as pairs, which of course had been read, misread as paintings of couples. And so it's that kind of, you know, language and conception I've been, I tried to clear yeah. up. And, and her, she loved to um, encode uh, sexual identity and desire in still life puns and elements mm -hmm. like the orgy of phallic bananas in the foreground yeah, here. Exactly. Which which she, yeah, she winks at them when she moves that into the yeah. picture. Yeah. So just a couple of figures from the art world, then we'll move mm -hmm. to the conclusion. Mm -hmm. Henry Geldzhauer, of course, uh, essential to the development of the collections of the Met, mm -hmm. which you two have inherited. Um, such mm -hmm. a, a great supporter of artists. She paints this in 1967, mm -hmm. trying to get his eye in a sense. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, with mixed results, some not so fabulous, but this does get to the heart of him as a person. I know he had mm -hmm. a big impact on a lot of artists, including my mm -hmm. buddy, Stephen Hannock, who's here on the Zoom mm -hmm. uh, watching today. Um, and then Linda Nochlin, mm -hmm. who's special to me because she was my dissertation mm -hmm. advisor. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a great quote from, and I, I found a picture of her when she was younger around wow. the same time. Um, Linda Nachlin, great quote. Neil catches some kind of existential anxiety that all contemporary urban thinking people have. That's what comes out. 
You know, if mm-hmm. you watch Linda's uh, Linda's uh, interviews about Neil, it's a kind of love hate relationship. Right? You get the feeling that she was tough to get along with Neil, and that's mm. something that you also hear <laughs> in like uh, Alex Alex Katz's quote that he said she seemed like a very belligerent housewife, which is not typical Alex Katz, <laughs> but you know. Um, she was hard to get along with at times. And, and Linda talks about sitting with her four-year-old and grabbing on the daisy and making mm-hmm. sure she's not moving on the couch there. But, you know, gosh darn it, didn't uh, Alice Neal capture Linda Nochlin mm-hmm. straight up? The face, yeah. the intensity of expression, mm-hmm. um, the, the firmness of her jaw and her chin, mm-hmm. and also the ring, which everyone who ever mm-hmm. knew her knows. She wore these massive costume jewelry ring. Mm-hmm. She's the Hang them on the lectern when she <laughs> talked for emphasis. And that really moved me a lot. And that arm yeah. straight out, right? There's a kind yeah. of assertiveness to her. Mm-hmm. In that this, hand is amazing. Portrait. Yeah, all, all the tension that that resides in that in that hand. Yeah. You know, every exactly. joint is, is bent and yeah. the pressure that she's exerting on the um on the, the on arm Daisy of the sofa. Here. Yeah, and, and the arm and of the sofa. Daisy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's that tension which is both physical and intellectual mm-hmm. because. You know, she was a monstrous, amazing yeah. intellect to talk to. Her. And and she talks about how um, the feminists were the ones who rediscovered, who discovered Alice mm-hmm. Neal, mm-hmm. right? And, and it, you know, giving themselves credit in the sense, yeah. credit in the sense. Um, but now, you know, it's morphed a little bit. So we see Neal through this exhibit from many different perspectives and not mm-hmm. just that, you know, in, in a very mm-hmm. healthy way and, and an appealing way. And you mentioned these two portraits, Kelly, Andy Warhol, 1970, Mm -hmm. and the amazing one by Robert Smithson from Mm -hmm. 1962 when he was just starting out as an artist, Mm -hmm. Um, warts and all, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, The the sewn up from Valerie Solanas having shot him here um, and Smithson with horrible acne, which Mm -hmm. he had, uh, terrible acne, which you see that there. And in a way, I mean, I kind of see these as taking the male art world and cutting it down and Mm -hmm. treating them like anybody else, right? You know, they are not the lionized figures of the New York school. They're uh, inordinately human. And she portrays them uh, in that way. Um, Jason, can you go back one slide? I just, I also wanted to point out that I'm so glad that you, yeah, yeah. I'm so glad you inserted this slide because it, this is so instructive, this particular comparison, 1970, 1962. And in 62, this is one of the shifts that I, that I was referring to earlier, a shift that took place in her practice around the time she moved to the Upper Upper West Side, and and Smithson represents a path not taken, an artistic path not taken. And so she briefly returns in the early '60s to a um, very brushy, very expressionistic style, filled edge to edge. Edge. There's a lot of impasto on Smithson's cheek to represent just that that yeah. um, kind of physical affliction that you mentioned. But you know, not eight years later, she paints Andy Warhol, and this is where she, you know, she arrives at her um, kind of an early version of her late late unfinished style. And so mm-hmm. much of that canvas is left primed, but but unpainted. The lines exist without fill in, and so you know, Smithson was a path not taken for her. Yeah. And, but but Warhol represented the the future, um, the future of her yeah. practice. And the confidence in that painting on the left mm-hmm. is of an order of magnitude mm-hmm. far beyond <laughs> the kind of grottiness that you see on the right. You know, yeah. It's a great portrait on the right but there's something else going on mm-hmm. on the left. That's Definitely. just, you know, something Olympian, I think. Um, let me just run through the end. I just want to point out people haven't seen the show yet. There's a really compelling section called Art as History, where uh, this is, you know, the, in this moment, it's great to get loans from within your own institution. Mm-hmm. Although I know in the Met, it's not so easy because it's all <laughs> different departments, et cetera, but to juxtapose masterpieces from other areas, um, Vincent and Mary. Um, with a work by Alice, you see that here, um, and this idea of motherhood, and uh, it's striking how the old frames look so old, and the new frames, or the the reveal frames, or even her simple flattened white frames look terrific with these paintings, as opposed to the kind of uh, Upper East Side domestic apartment frames that you see on some of these paintings. That's just my personal opinion, but I wanted to add a couple things. You mm-hmm. have this, the greatest painting for the students was this one, the Valadon painting, from mm-hmm. the Met, which is in the show. And then I wanted to also add Motorson Becker, mm-hmm. who I think is another, I, I know you guys know this, but yeah. just to show people, is another terrific sort of impactful artist 
early 20th mm-hmm. century German expressionist who's dealing with motherhood and her mm-hmm. embodies her own body, children, pregnancy, post-pregnancy, mm-hmm. uh, intimacy. Um, and here is uh, here is the, the greatest odalisque of the 20th century um, in a true inversion of that term mm-hmm. by uh, Alice Neal. Uh, painting this uh, pregnant Maria. So, you know, what 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 were the reasons for including this art as history section of the exhibition? Maybe just briefly. Well, just very briefly, um, the Neil has been sort of stereotyped as a little bit of an art historical anomaly uh, because she doesn't uh, uh, fix or affix to twentieth uh, century avant garde. Um, as much as most other artists that we, we learn about. And we don't learn yeah. about Neil in graduate school for partly for that reason and the, and the obstacles that women have to arrive in the canon. Um, so we wanted to use the Met's collection to situate her uh, in the art of the past and the art of her contemporaries. Yeah. And there are no didactics, so we're not making mm-hmm. specific points. Right. It's not, it's not right. cause it's not cause and effect. Just um, use your eyes. Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. draw yeah. your own conclusions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's good. It's good that. A um, couple more works. Mm-hmm. I, I, Carmen and Judy is a really striking work where you mm-hmm. see images of frailty, dependency, mm-hmm. um, sensitivity, but also, you know, I think you rightly mm-hmm. make the point in the panel that this is a woman who worked for her. Mm-hmm. There's a kind of a economic relationship mm-hmm. here, um, which is something that may be a little disturbing um, or complicates the the yeah. situation in mm-hmm. this painting at the same time that you know there's a woman that she knew well she, mm-hmm. she knew intimately mm-hmm. um and in terms of what she wore and her body and this kind of thing but mm-hmm. it's also as out as Hilton Alls wrote in his piece in the New Yorker you know a, a, a remarkable thing to, for a woman of color in this period to feel comfortable enough to reveal her body mm-hmm. um and her child to a white woman that she worked mm-hmm. for I guess yeah. so you know, th- this is a this is an extraordinary painting, one of the you know my, most striking in the shows, mm-hmm. and I think it's well situated um, in the environs of, of the gallery. So, Randy, Jason, if some... I can be if I can be just so bold, because I do have yeah. a hard stop at two thirty, and I would love yeah. to take some questions from. Yeah, let's go ahead Antonio. and we'll do that. Mm-hmm. So let's go through. I just wanted to finish up just to show you this, mm-hmm. which is a, another one of the standouts. Black draftee James Hunter in nineteen sixty five. I encourage everyone to read the story of this person. And the reason why it's an unfinished, Mm -hmm. finished painting Mm -hmm. of a kind, she does sign it on the back. And one of the most compelling paintings from this period, especially of a person of color. And I was in, again, Philadelphia yesterday. Mm -hmm. And my favorite painting on the planet, maybe, is Mm -hmm. this one by uh, Barclay Hendricks. And there's a nice little video by uh, Barclay Hendricks, who died a couple of years ago, talking about Alice Neal. If you go online, you can Mm -hmm. find it. But this painting, Miss T, uh, which Philadelphia cleverly bought one year after it was made and Mm -hmm. was the one that has stopped me in my tracks since high school basically yeah. going to that museum. And there's such an affinity here without actual mm-hmm. influence, mm-hmm. right? Um, and the, uh, this is the painting that most struck me in the last room about abstraction called Night, another one of these views from across the well, across the street uh, from her apartment and this extraordinary sort of ripping image of a, a fiery furnace-like view into another apartment. We're all voyeurs in New York City um, and she's capturing that there. but in an abstract mode in 1959, which, you know, Clifford still, I think, would recognize. Mm -hmm. But as Kelly and and Randy have been talking about, you know, not the path that she chose to follow. Mm -hmm. And yet here is an example of an artist who could dash off a picture in a certain mode, which leads you wanting more, right? Mm -hmm. I wish she'd done a little bit more in this vein. And yet, you know, what's she interested in? People, pictures (laughs) of people. So I'll end with this. Thanksgiving on the left from 1965, which she describes in in one interview as a turkey, and Randy will set us straight on what kind of poultry this is. And then on the right, a portrait of her son, but she Mm -hmm. does the exact same thing with her son as she does with the bird. She Mm -hmm. puts one arm over the edge of the chair or the sink, splays the legs out strangely, turns the head a little, and treats them almost in the same way. No disrespect to Richard Mm -hmm. and their relationship, but I think this is the Alice Neal eye. She's looking at everything mm-hmm. around her. She's subjecting it to that vision. And she is, you know, she's communicating to, uh, it to us in a way that is clearly connecting with a vast part of not just the art audience, but, you know, the good citizens 
of, of New York and beyond who are coming. And I'm seeing things in the chat. People are flying in to see this exhibit. Wow. It's, it's that wow. kind so of Mal show. Malvika, Malvika, could we have a few questions now? Yeah, um, I, I'm actually wondering, would it be okay if I email you the questions maybe after Me? Oh. Or uh, Kelly and Randy and I can connect you with the askers because I, I think this would be a beautiful time to go to poetry. Well, is there anything anything that we might just talk about for a second, somebody? I mean, do you want to go to questions? Um, I, well, I, I just want to I just, respect I, I don't know that Kelly and I can personally respond to 50 or All 75 right. qu by questions. <laughs> if, I don't know how many, I don't know how many have come in, but I feel like we've done uh, all the talking and um, that, sure. Okay. Um, um, I'd love. I'd love just one or two, and then I. I have to break. Sure. Yeah. Let's go ahead. Well, our first question will come from Kikesa Kimbwala, who is in a noisy place in D.C. So I'll read it on her behalf, but she's here and present. Um, she said, "I haven't had an opportunity yet to see the show, but have been developing sort of interpretations of visual discourse around sort of Neil's work." Um, and her question is, when thinking about her politics and her relationships to many of her subjects. How does the show grapple with the degrees of privilege between Alice Neal as an artist and her socially underprivileged subjects? Um, maybe that's a good question to open with. Mm -hmm. Kelly, you take this on so well. Yeah, and... yeah. No, we we grapple with it um, overtly in labels, and um, I do in my catalog essay as as well. Um, and so it goes to our um, effort to to you know um, describe as um, to both describe and problematize her relationship to to her sitters and so rather than presuming some platonic you know um, uh, intersubjective union you know we're, we're interested in in parsing um, you know uh, relative degrees of privilege exactly so it's all in 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 the book and in the labels we talk about that a lot including the label for Carmen and Judy which Jason referred to Okay, brilliant, thank you. And I think for a second and closing question, we'll go to Catherine Olson, who is a painter of her own. Um, and Catherine, you should be able to turn on your microphone whenever. Yeah, hi, hello, thank you so much um, for today's talk. It's been truly fascinating. Um, I'd love to just generally know like what were some of the challenges you ran into um, and what were some of the most rewarding moments of putting together this exhibition? And then if you had to do it again, would you do anything differently? Um, I'll, 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 I'll offer something and then I, I'm curious how Kelly mm -hmm. would answer this last part of that. Um, well, the, the challenge was partly the timeline. Um, mm -hmm. You know, every so much of life is, is driven by money and the calendar, right? And we, the Modern Contemporary Department was given the slot of spring, summer 2021, take it or leave it. And of course we didn't want to miss this opportunity and it would be the first modern contemporary show back in the main building after Met Breuer. So there was a lot of deliberation about what that first show should be to signal modern contemporary um, back at, on Fifth Avenue. Um, and so there was a lot of back and forth and our department chair, Sheena Wagstaff floated the idea of an Alice Neal retrospective, not even, it wasn't even more than two and a half years ago. Um, and we jumped at it realized the time was right. We didn't, of course, realize the time would be even righter uh, than, than we, we had before. And um, so partly was the challenge of the timeline, which is why Kelly and I are on it together mm -hmm. as co-curators, uh, partly because no, not a, a single curator couldn't have pulled this off in two, just two, over two years. Um, I mean, it's not, Kelly and I were working on other things <laughs> at same, as well, but it, it would take two uh, curators to pull it off. So Kelly, what would you do different? Oh, I, you know, I don't know. I'm so, um, so gosh, um, I'm, I'm so attached to the show and in, in the form it is. I mean, we've, we, we've talked about renaming the section on the nude, the naked, um, <laughs> um, because actually Jason, your comment that, that even when Neil painted clothes sitters, they appear naked. Um, you know, it was nakedness that she, the existential and physical fact of nakedness that so interested her and, um, uh, I can't even, I guess there were a few, I don't know. It, that's, that, that's the one that keeps, that's the one piece that keeps coming back that mm -hmm. maybe we would have re retooled that a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, maybe. Being facetious, I'm being facetious because for the moment, 
I don't have I don't have critical distance enough to critique no, it that either, much. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm still I'm still a little bit maybe too much in love with it. Yeah. And it's are there any are there any works that you couldn't get that you really yes. wish you got yes. that we could that you might say people you need to go here or there so, to see them. So go. Um, this is a serious uh, regret. Um, the Yale Art Gallery would not could not lend their drawing Joy of Life, Joie de Vivre by Neil. It opens my my essay. Um, very explicit, wonderful detail. <laughs> the watercolor opens my essay, and it should be in the exhibition. I really I miss it every time I walk into that section of the gallery. We but talk about I, it. We talk about it, even though it's not there. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. it, but I think we, yes, yes. Oh. Uh, oh, yeah. who found that image? Thank you. Um, but that's, that's our uh, crack team at the rail. Isn't oh it? man, the rail, Builds the rail up. team's on it. Yeah. So <laughs> we couldn't. The, the, this is some some you know um, uh, polymorphic uh, pornography meets Disney silly symphony cartoon. It's, it's X-rated so Looney Tunes. Yes, X-rated Looney Tunes. Um, thank you so much. I think uh, rapid fire. Our next question will come from Lynn Crawford, and then I would love to go to poet, mm -hmm. uh, who's actually a, a nonfiction writer today. But Lynn uh, should be able to turn on the microphone whenever you'd like. Hi. Thank you so much for this. Um, I just have a question about scale. I noticed, especially um, striking when the portrait of her granddaughter, how tiny and frail the feet were, but the legs seemed sturdy. And I noticed that a lot. Um, and I just wondered if you could um, talk about that. It was, it was really moving and interesting. And I wondered what your thoughts were. Um, you're asking about scale or kind yeah, of... it seemed like sometimes there were very tiny hands with sturdy limbs, oh, or, yes, you know, yes. sort of intentionally so, um, proportions, yeah, yeah, bodily yeah. Proportion yeah. off, uh, intentionally off proportion. That I'm just yeah. curious to hear your take on. Yeah, that that's deliberate. I mean, you know, all of her work, she she builds, she kind of cultivates. Um, imperfection, awkwardness. There, there are always moments where the parts don't don't quite fit together. In the portrait of Duty and Carmen, one hand is enormous, the other is smaller, and it's it's just endemic to Neil's style. I think it's a. Um, I mean, we 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 connected in our introduction to her humanism, that you know her um, the spirit of her radical humanism led her to. Um, seek imperfection and in, in others and and to to build it into her paintings not not as a way to to criticize or pathologize but as a way to love you know i think um and she also found it fascinating <laughs> i think that she uh, the, the 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 clinical side of her um thought it was was interesting the, the quirks of the human body and and so she exacerbated them in her pictures Randy. and i would just add to that by way of closing that i think neil is always thinking about the four sides of her canvas and to some extent the distortions in what you think of as distortions or exaggerations or modifications to anatomy are often in response to the the four edges of the picture plane so the head of Nick, people make it make a point about London Auckland's head looking big but I think she wanted it to extend really nearly to the top uh, so it you know she's fully happy to shift proportions in response to her picture plane and mm -hmm. to her canvas. Thank you. Thanks so much. I wonder if we could maybe squeeze in just one more question. And, and Randy, I understand you have to exit a little early, but perhaps you could catch the very beginning of it. But um, this question comes from Diana Page right in the chat. She's asking, how would you say Neil's approach to nudity and portraiture compares with Lu Lucian Freud, uh, a much fetid painter in comparison? Mm -hmm. um, I haven't really thought about that <laughs> very much because I think in part because Neil interests me so much more than than Freud and um, and I've been asked several times and this is not the question that was posed here but I've been both of us both Randy and I have been asked a few times what do you think Neil took from Lucy and Freud and and we always say well she was 22 years his his senior so <laughs> the question is I think more what he what he took from from her so I just, you know, he's not interesting enough for me to be able to answer it in great detail. Um, Randy, would you? Yeah, this is one of the <laughs> millions of ways Kelly and I are very much alike. Um, yeah, I mean, agreed. I find Neil far more interesting. Um, 
you know, she's not, I think even though Freud is painting often abject bodies, he still is so consciously painting them beautifully. Um, Neil doesn't care have so much about that same sense of kind of painterly beauty. I, I think her mm -hmm. paintings are beautiful paintings, but she's not fetishizing paint to make flesh look in any way so seductive or, I don't know, I'm not, I'm, I would need to spend more time to articulate this better, but he's still trying to paint them in a way that you go, wow, look how beautiful that paint is. Neil doesn't really care that you have that response, I don't think. Mm -hmm. And I respect her more for it. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> um, with, with, so with that, I, I need to, to take off for an appointment, but it's been great mm -hmm. spending time with everyone. And I hope we did answer some enough questions and um, I'll, we'll follow up about some other questions that maybe we can, we can um, follow up on. So, okay. okay. Thank you so much, Randy. Thank, sure. Thank you so Bye. much, Randy. Bye. Um, and I think maybe that's a, a beautiful place to transition to um, our reading. So at the rail, we have a tradition of ending with poetry. Uh, we've recently sort of uh, stretched this out laterally to contain texts, performance, music of all kinds. Uh, so today I'm thrilled to welcome our uh, writer laureate of the day, Devin Goldring, to the stage. Uh, a writer from New Jersey, Devin C. with the FA, uh, in fiction from Pratt Institute in 2019, fairly recently, and they're currently uh, an MFA candidate at Columbia, uh, focusing on nonfiction. Um, Devin, take it away. Hi, thank you so much, Malvika, for that introduction. Uh, thank you, Jason, Kelly, and Randy. This was a wonderful conversation. I can't wait to see the show. Uh, and thank you, Brooklyn Rail, for inviting me to read. Um, this is an excerpt from my current memoir project. I upload a series of five photos of myself to the internet. I am bare, nude, there's want in my eyes. Clicking through them, I make sure that all of the angles of my body bow gently inward and outward as they lead from my ribs to my waist down around my hips. I know my subscribers are paying to gaze upon my body, but sometimes they look at my face in a compartmentalized kind of way. They see my mouth, lips agape, teeth entombed beneath muscle and skin covered in red lacquer, ready to be abounding with their fantasy. Or it's in my eyes, gentle and pleading, gazing at voyeurs through screens with a faux thirst to be taken. I know that when my fans look at me, they see only the parts that they can penetrate and those that communicate carnality. But when I look at my face, breaking down the hole into constituents as they do, I see my father. It's comfortless to think about my father while looking at the top section of my naked body, the part that is always uncovered. Yet still, I have the same thought I always do when I think about myself as a product of him. I swim like my father. I swell with pride knowing that our coastal upbringing spreading across decades on the Jersey shore led me to sway my arms with the broadness of my shoulders the same way he did. We kick out legs with our knees buckled in as mine bend improperly as his do, a painful inheritance. Analogous would not be a word one could use to describe my appearance in relation to my father. In fact, unalike would be the most accurate. It is so much so that never once have I been told that I look like him, nor has it been asserted that I, I appear similar to my mother or brother. However, when I break it down, compartmentalize, pick my features apart as men do online, they are his laid upon another skull. As a child, I'd peer out of the window in our gray green wallpaper dining room until I could see the headlights of my father's 1987 Saab Turbo shine down the cobblestone driveway in the dark. I sat in the foyer until he would open up the front door and instantly I could tell the quality of his workday by the flare in his nose. He used to say that I got lucky because there was no way of hiding his Jewish heritage with a beak like his and mine was gentle, smooth, small. We both have a drop underneath the tip made by soft triangles above our nostrils pushing too firmly upwards and a narrow bridge with a small knot of extra cartilage descending outwards. I think the deviance exists within dispositions. The framing of his nostrils hooked sharply, defiantly, spurting out at his cheekbones. Mine are soft. I don't have much of a crease where my sidewalls meet the tip, as though I've never scrunched it up in pain or prepared to sneeze. 
though if I flex the muscles in my nose, which I often do when I'm foaming with frigid furiousness, they inflect as his do, curving inwards harshly, defining the flesh. Perhaps they are the same. Mine cradles relinquish softness of melancholy and his clenches the harsh silhouette of rage, but that once long ago his looked like mine and his muscles froze as he flared. My teeth and lips are solely mine, at least in how they appear. There is no one in my lineage with whom they share a similar shape or size. My teeth are green, gray, red. They flash in the back of my skull as I zoom in on the crooked, cracked edges of my front teeth peeking out below my upper lip. That's what I remember when I think of that day. Green ivy, gray blur, iron red fluid on concrete. I was playing within the trees, running across ground creeping plants held back by a barrier wall. It was raining lightly, spitting even, from the bleak Argentine sky. I was charging up the mild incline, bouncing from oak to oak, and then the ivy consumed me. All I remember was the blur and the sharp thud of brick wall making contact with the malleable flesh between my, te my lip and teeth. My dad found me on the concrete driveway, basking in my own bodily viscous liquids with my central incisors touching my chin through the hole that had been created in my facial meat. He was tender, spoon feeding me jello and holding popsicles for me to suck until the sinews desperate to hold on to the dangling tusks finally retreated with the promise of disrepair. The fall shifted my adult teeth still veiled above gums, leaving me with a gap in the center of my mouth, crooked on the left side. Men online look at my pout with a hankering to fill it with one muscle or another. They don't know that it's made of brick walls, roots, hard edges. They don't know it was made to achingly plead to a father, make it feel better, and not to moan their names. They can't find it in the place that emerges when harsh meat's tender. I've hidden it under ivy and red lacquer. The skin surrounding our eyes, the folds that hold our expression, demeanor, pleat in notably variant manners, rendering my father and me as disparate entities from distinctive bloodlines. Pulling towards his cheekbones, the center of focus on his face appears narrow, tugging upward near the brow. His look is beady with startle or perhaps bewilderment. Mine are open, welcoming, yet to be wrinkled with age. My online subscribers say they're akin to a doe, I would declare they are that of a buck, lazily consuming, aware of the violent hunt surrounding me, searching for an escape route, a place to run. However, the gelatinous structure encased within the surrounding skin are shared in hue, in generational want for more, in the gaze we have upon the world. It feels odd to note that our eyes are particularly beautiful, whereas I have no problem vocalizing that my stomach, hips, ass, and the like are well-favored and statuesque. I've been told of the fair nature of all these parts, eyes included, by many, and yet only commenting on what comes below the neck feels justified. Perhaps it's an objectification of the self. Maybe I'd rather not attach a face to all that I do. Either way, both my father and I have eyes, and they are beautiful. In the light, they are almost liquefied, turning this golden amber that begs to be consumed, yet... When shade cloaks our face, they morph with it, becoming the color of shadows on desolate mountainsides. We are fluid and we flee, yet what it is that we're running from, that fear is held within our gaze. I can't be certain, but I believe we attempt to liberate ourselves from differing despairs. Perhaps it is an inheritance, this need to find hardship and a way out, going back to our blood spilled in Austria or persecution in Roman Spain. I zoom back out on the picture, noticing the likes and tips that have come in. I know that they do not think about it, but yet I still wonder if they know that I am a person with a likeness to their father, with hard edges and memories rooted in color, with wanting and grief and a destiny to flee. Without them holding the knowledge, I get to keep that which formed me into an unlike inheritance so that I don't mind if they break me apart, reading their own desire into my face that does not hold the same. Thank you. Thank you so much, Devin. Um, and thank you, Randy, uh, in absentia, Kelly and Jason. And of course, thank you to all of you who tuned in today in the audience and in the chat. Um, we're celebrating the Rails 20th anniversary this year. Uh, so as a nonprofit, if you enjoyed today's program, please consider making a donation to Keeping the Rail and our special projects free, relevant, and independent. 
Uh, and please join us again tomorrow when we're joined by photographer and performance artist Liz Cohen with Deandra Lawson, Julio, Julio Cesar Morales, and Olga Viso for a conversation on body magic, uh, an exhibition view at Arizona State University Art Museum through uh, the end of this month. That will be, as always, at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Um, other than that, this has been so fantastic. Thank you all so much. Um, and you can all kind of turn on your microphones and say goodbye on your way out if you'd like. Um, but thank you so much. This was incredible. Thank you, everybody, thank you, for attending. Thank you, Kelly. 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 Thank you, Thank you. Good job, everybody. Thank you, Rail Team, as ever. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Devin. Thank you, Devin.